Okay, good morning, everyone. And I would like to welcome everyone to the 19th edition of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting and our first one for 2021. My name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps. And it's great to have everybody here for a, a new year. And I think we've got two very exciting uh, companies on this morning's meeting. I'm just quickly going to run through some introductory slides and uh, some basic housekeeping, and then we're going to get straight into it. Compliance and disclaimer. Uh, so for anybody who hasn't joined us before, um, I run these events uh, on a fortnightly basis, plus minus for an hour. We've got two companies every two weeks with uh, 30 minutes for each company, which is broken down into 20 minute prezzel and then 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box below uh, rather than the chat function. It's just easier for me to moderate the questions to our presenters at the end. Uh, please note the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel probably in the next day or so. Uh, so if a presenter happens to skip over a slide or you miss something, uh, you can go back and watch the recording of this. Uh, meeting and our previous AHEAN meetings, uh, if you want to have a look back at some of the other companies which have presented in the past. Uh, you can follow Coffee Microcaps on Twitter. We're at C Microcaps. As I said, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, and hit the bell for notifications of when new recordings goes up, along with when this one will be posted. And uh, we're also on LinkedIn where I post some more long form content. And I also have a weekly paid newsletter via the Substack platform where I highlight one interesting ASX microcap stock every week. Uh, our two companies this morning, the first one we're going to hear from is Urbanize and our second company is going to be SkyFi and with that I'd like to hand over to our first presenter Sarb Jan, the CEO of Urbanize. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, Sarb, do you want to start sharing your screen? There you go. Uh, I, if you just go to present mode now, yeah, I can see your cover slide perfectly now. Great, thank you very much, Mark, and look at thank you everyone else for your time as well. Um, so what I was going to do is just kind of take you guys through a bit of what we do as an organisation, Urbanize, and a bit about the uh, half year results that we just released. Um. A bit about what we actually do as a company. So we've got two main uh, SaaS products that we push out to markets. So obviously, we're a company. Uh, we have a cloud platform around strata management. So that's all the financial side about running a strata building. Um, and then we have a facilities management platform. So that's more around repairs and maintenance. So that's you know making sure that you're compliant. You know all the administration, all the safety, and all the asset uh, work that one needs to do when they manage any any large building or complex. Uh, in terms of where we are globally, so I've gone based in Sydney, our head office, uh, but we've got staff now in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, up in Malaysia. We've got two offices in South Africa, the Middle East, and Bulgaria. Um, we've got customers over in New Zealand and uh, Europe as well, with about a third of our revenue now coming outside Australia. So look, the interesting thing there is that, you know, that we have really been able to push out into different countries. So we're in 15 countries all up that the product uh, can move across our borders. Um, look, the fundamentals of the product that we offer, it's all SaaS. There's a single version for every customer in the entire world. It's quite a broad product suite. So it does all the various components that a strata manager or a facilities manager needs to do to actually run their business. Uh, we, we've invested a lot in AI and analytics and really peppered that throughout the platform. Um, we spend a lot on the UX of our system just to help with the training and the onboarding. We do a lot on the mobile app side of things, um, especially on the Strata platform. Look, it's, it's kind of funny here in Australia, we're the only real legitimate cloud platform out there. Um, the other guys still literally send you a CD in the mail once a year. Um, so they don't have all the mobile apps and web apps that, that tenants and landlords and strata buildings are expecting today. And lastly, we're fully integrated across both of our products. Um, that's quite relevant in the Middle East market where the strata manager and facilities manager have horizontally integrated. In terms of uh, our customer lifecycle and how we make money from the strata side of things, 
It's usually about a one to six month conversion for someone to choose to buy our platform. It's three to nine months implementation. The reason it's so long, it's, it's a core finance system. So, you know, think about moving from something like a MyOb to zero. Look, it does take some time to make that migration, but once you're there, look, you pretty much, you, you're there forever. And there we get paid per lot. So for every apartment that we have on our system, then we have the facilities management platform, slightly longer sale cycle, because there's a bit more of an enterprise sale. I mean, some of the customers we do there, you know, we do the WA electricity grid, the uh, Queensland electricity grid, the Victorian grid. Uh, we do um, lots of large property owners, lots of council, lots of large asset owners. So it's a much more complex uh, sales process around there. Much quicker to implement because there isn't a large financial migration. And there we get to charge our customers up per, per user per month. From the actual product side of things, look, I mean, the strata, the, the core of that is the accounting platform, but it does fundamentally everything that a strata manager needs to do. And it really becomes their core ERP for them to run their business and do all the various things they have to do. So it does, you know, all the invoicing or the strata minutes, the meetings, the budgeting, the reporting. Um, it does all the community portals, so how tenants and landlords interact. And there's a whole bunch of integration, you know, to different banks and whatnot that we include as part of that uh, product. On the facilities management side of things, look, it's all around the uh, managing jobs that come in, the asset management. It's the Uber style service for your trade staff. Now, so for example, one of our customers is Euro Garages. So we do all the Caltech stores around Australia. Um, so in that case, they actually use us to manage all the staff that come on site. You know, just to make sure whenever someone comes on site, you know, that they've done their safety induction, they take an after photo, then we do all the quoting and job management through there as well. Uh, we've got a lot around customer portals there. We, we, as I said before, we do a lot around the analytics side of things. You know, so one of our customers is IKEA up in Asia. They use us in about seven different countries now. Um, IKEA, as you'd expect, they're big about benchmarking stores against each other. So, you know, so we, we you know, monitor their maintenance spend, their active spend, plan, energy, all those kind of things. And then we have mobile apps for uh, all the trade stuff. You know, so we can kind of create that Uber style experience for repairs and maintenance. Look, the really interesting thing about the more so the facilities management product is we have a lot of network growth. So the way it generally tends to work is we'll sign up a facilities management outsourcing firm. Um, they'll sign up lots of property asset owners, and then they'll kind of mandate to the subcontractors that they have to actually use our platform. So a couple of simple examples. So, you know, we've signed up a facilities management outsourcing firm called Ventia, Ventia Vision Stream here in Australia. Um, they won Frankston Council, they won, you know, um, Auckland Council, they won Energy Queensland, they've won Anglo America. So as they win more and more work, they um, sign up for more licenses for our platform. And then as they do, they ask the subcontractors to often sign up to our platform because that's just how they'll get the work and that's how they get paid. Um, from a uh, time perspective, look, it's a huge market. I mean, right now we are still fundamentally a rounding error, which, you know, which kind of gives me confidence, right? That there is a lot of room for us to grow on the facility side of things. Um, from a growth perspective, I mean, we have done well. I mean, we've gone six and a half X in the last three and a bit years. Um, and that's, you know, the, the, hopefully the trajectory that will continue to grow at. Um, a couple of little points here as well is um, the uh, two components of what we get paid. There's professional services. So this is when someone pays to get set up onto our platform as part of like the implementation or onboarding fee. And then we have the actual uh, license fee that we charge our customers as well. Look, the real macro trends around the facility side of things is there's a tendency towards outsourcing. Um, so, you know, great thing about living in Australia, most regulated country and probably the entire world is there's lots of legislation around safety and compliance and more and more large asset owners are choosing to actually outsource that. Um, we're getting a lot of uh, growth from our global customers. And the current main focus of the organization is still the two products, but we are investing on probably a lot more on the sales and marketing side on the actual facility side. From a financial perspective, look, it's been a year. I mean, you know, revenue is up 29.4%, which we're quite excited about. I mean, cash burn is uh, up from you know, 237 a month to 290 a month. Now we purposefully did that. So we did break even you know, just as COVID happened. Um, but we kind of decided, look, we've got, you know, after your cap raise, we have 9 million bucks in the bank that we do actually want to probably spend some of that money on sales and marketing. 
So we're busy kind of building out that sales function throughout the organization, just so we can make sure we continue to accelerate the growth. Um, from a uh, from a cash flow perspective, as I said, we still have nine million in the bank. You know, we are burning about two hundred seventy grand, two hundred ninety thousand per month. So that really gives us a long runway, and it's one of those things that will probably naturally actually come into cash flow in the next in the next uh, period. You know, as the contracts that we've already signed up, um, you know, convert from backlog to actual live customers. Um, you know, it's been a long path. I mean, I've been with the organization for about three and a half years. I've been the CEO for a bit over two years now. So, you know, during that period, you know, we've, we've managed our costs. We've kind of finished a lot of the product builds. So we're really an organization that's now kind of getting out of the R&D phase and into a lot more of the commercialization phase. And as I said, that was the uh, break in that we kind of had just as COVID happened. Um, but now we've decided to purposefully go into burn uh, to, um, to keep our growth. And that wasn't because there was any change in the revenue. It's more on the expenditure side as we've kind of continued to focus on investment. Probably a really interesting slide here is our networking capital. Um, so what this slide shows is, you know, what deferred revenue we have, i.e. customers prepaying up front versus how much we owe our debtors. And what we've successfully done over the last three years is we've actually worked kind into networking capital. So what that fundamentally means is that our customers actually pay for us to operate. Um, and the reason is, look, on the facility side of things, look, we tend to get almost uh, probably 90% of our customers will pay for 12 months in advance. And, you know, we give a small discount for that. Um, but that does actually give us cash to run the business. And on the strata side, look, we have a mix between quarterly and annual payments there as well. And again, what that does, it really locks in the customers. Um, and from a lock-in perspective, look, it is a very, very sticky platform. Look, you know, we do lose customers from time to time, but it's very rare. It tends to be if a company goes out of business or, or you know, they have some sort of major structural change. I mean, besides that, we have very, very high uh, customer retention. Great, Mark. Well, I might hand it over to you to kind of see if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, we have a couple of questions, but I've got one emailed in ahead of time. So let me go to that first and then I'll go to the, the live questions, if I may. Hmm. Um, it, it's in relation to the, the, the 4C that just came out. Um, you know, you lost a, a legacy client there where, you know, the their requirements didn't align with your, I guess, IT development, development roadmap. Um, hmm. You know, is there... Is there the question, I guess, is, you know, is that going to be something we should see more of or was this kind of an isolated incident uh, from a legacy customer? Sure, sure, sure. And I think that, that, that's a good question. Let me actually just uh, flick back to a previous slide. So yeah. from the products that we have today, they're pretty straightforward. We've got a Strider product and a facilities management system. Um, I mean, when I first joined Urbanize, we actually had six different things that we went out to market with. And one of them was a, what I'd call like a B to C facilities management platform. So the idea is if you're, I don't know, a tenant in an apartment, you can go get someone to clean your pool, walk your dog, do your, do your laundry and those kind of things. It was actually Urbanizer's first customer about 10 years ago. Um, and we only had one customer on that product. So we didn't make a real conscious choice to no longer support it, no longer develop that product. So, you know, we did expect to lose that revenue at some point. So from that perspective, look, it's a one-off. They were the only customer on that. Uh, system. Um, in terms of the other legacy platforms that we have that we're no longer developing, you know, we have less than say five thousand dollars per month of revenue in those areas. So yeah, look, I very much expect it to be a one-off thing. Okay, great. And then let me just uh, get to some of these questions that come in live. Um, what percentage of the facilities management businesses are get connected to office buildings, and what would be the potential impact of permanently lower office occupancy levels? Yeah, look, I would love to say that we had the foresight um, and we knew about COVID and we decided not to go after commercial office, but no, that was a pure accident. Um, so the reason we have very, very little exposure to the actual corporate real estate space is because we go after the, the really the tier two facilities management outsourcing firms. So most corporate real estate around the world is managed by JLO, Cushman Wakefield and CBRE. And they're, they're all your multi-billion dollar tier one organizations. Um, and organizations like that don't tend to buy software from us. They're probably more likely to buy the entire organization. So in that respect, we have very, very little exposure to corporate real estate. 
Um, the kind of exposure that we have is more around critical infrastructure. So it's your power grids, your water grids. We do a lot around local governments. Um, we do a lot around uh, mine camps. So it's more so the industrial side of things and the infrastructure side. So in that case, look, we've, we've been very, very fortunate through COVID. The other thing that COVID did, and it's a, oh, it sounds a bit more, a bit more, but a bit of a blessing in disguise, that it really showed the value of cloud companies. So on our strata side, look, we're the only, you know, cloud platform in the country. So if you weren't on a platform like ours, when COVID happened, you had to quickly figure out like, how are you going to get people to work from home with in-house software, you know, set up citrus environments and all those kind of things. So it's really given us a good tailwind of, you know, people on the legacy tech trying to move over to us. Um, on the, also on the strata side, look, it's a residential platform. Um, so if you look around the, you know, the, all the construction happening, there is plenty of people still living in apartments right now. I think that um, leads nicely into the next question. Um, the large increase in implementation of being Q2, does this represent new customer wins or is it mostly the picket implementation? And I think maybe be preface that question by just explaining, uh, you know, what picket is for people who mightn't be familiar with it. Yeah, so look, I mean, we've been really successful on our Strata platform. So we've actually signed up the largest Strata manager in the country. So it's a company called Pika, Prudential Investment Corporation of Australia. Um, they've got about 250, 260,000 apartments that they've signed up to put onto our platform. Um, and we've been busy going through that migration today. Um, so we've finished off Victoria, we've done Queensland. Now we're very busy on the New South Wales side of that portfolio. I mean, it's worth, you know, 2 million bucks per year worth of recurring revenue for us. Um, so in terms of the professional fees, look, the majority of those have actually come out of the facilities division. So there's only about $150,000, $200,000 that's come out of PICA. The rest of it's out of actually other customers. Um, and just generically speaking, look, you know, professional services, they're one of the lead indicators for future license fee growth. So that means somebody's paying to put our software in. And once they're in, they kind of flick over to recurring revenue. So as long as professional services are high, look, I'm pretty confident about like, you know, the next quarter, the quarter after that. Okay, perfect. And then another question kind of, uh, are you still working with large strata management contracts, I guess, outside of PICA? Like are you still working with some of their competitors? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm going, you know, I probably can't name them specifically, but, um, what PIC have actually allowed us to do, you know, through, through the funding of, you know, of fees, what that we've been able to charge for them, is to build the Strata platform that works really, really well on the big end of town. You know, when you've got 10, 20, 30, 40,000 apartments. So, you know, we kind of hope over the next, you know, five to five years or so that we'll actually pick up all the top 10 Strata managers in the country. Because it's, it's, a, it's a funny case, as I said before, right, where we actually have no real legitimate competition. Um, the other parts are, you know, we have the largest Strata manager in New Zealand that's live on our system right now as well. Um, we've got some of the largest property owners and developers in the Middle East on our system. You know, we've got people in Bahrain, um, Israel, Jerusalem, uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Saudi in the UK as well, and down in South Africa. Um, yeah, so look, Pika is like a real cornerstone customer, but, you know, we are putting a lot of work uh, besides them as well. Yeah, and I, I know you mentioned it's actually good you still have this slide open for this next question. You, you know, you've got nine million bucks in cash um, it, and there's obviously a large opportunity ahead. Is there an additional investment in fixed costs to be needed at some point in the future? Or, you know, is it a typical cloud business where, you know, you scale server capacity as customer scale? Yeah, look, we look at our, our gross margin, you know, like with, with any good company, you know, it's, it's above 90% because the hosting and support cost is a very, very small component. Um, where, as I kind of mentioned before, we plan to spend the money is more around sales and marketing. Um, I mean, it's kind of funny, like every year as a CEO, like you have a different challenge. Uh, three years ago, it was more around the product. How do you make sure product is fit for market? We'd want some work. Um, then the second year was more around the implementation team. You know, we've done all this work. Now we've got to convert it to license fees. And, you know, the team grew from three to 15 staff, which is working really well right now. But the challenge for this year is sales and marketing. So the sales team has increased from uh, three people up to about eight, nine people now. And we've still got a few more heads to put in there. And, and that will probably be how we'll actually use this uh, cash. Just a really, in a real considered way to build up the sales and marketing function. So I hope, you know, bring in future license fee growth. Okay, great. 
Um, can you talk a bit about, uh, you know, is there any real main competitors that you see? It, it doesn't sound like from what you've said so far. And then just on the how customers come to you, is it, uh, is it from inquiries? You know, they're coming direct mm. to you or, you know, for, I guess, the local government and stuff, you know, is it tenders you're, you're bidding on? Yeah, good, good, good question. So okay, and I'll kind of split that up across the two different products because they are slightly different. Um, on the strata side of things, like, like we are now known as the biggest player in the Middle East, biggest player here in Australia. So we tend to have lots of inbound inquiries because what will happen, right, if I'm a strata manager um, and I lose a building to a competitor who's on Urbanize and I'll probably lose it because Urbanize has all the mobile apps and whatnot that the old platforms don't have. That doesn't have to happen many times before we actually get an inbound inquiry from them. Um, so on the Strata side, it's probably 1995 people reaching out to us. Um, and, it, and like I said, like there is no real legitimate cloud player out there right now. Um, on the facilities management side of things, look, we've found our niche, which is really the tier two FM outsources. So in that case, we'll go sign them up once and then they'll, they'll go and win the work and kind of you know, pay license fees as they go. There, it's probably oh, it's probably 50-50. Half the time they reach out to us, half the time we reach out to them, you know, through our kind of sales and marketing team. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and on the facilities management, I mean, you mentioned CBRE and Cushman and Wakefield. You know, is there ever a potential to sign up with one of those? Or are they, you know, just on a totally different level with totally different systems that, it, it, it you know, would be unrealistic to expect one of them to engage urbanize yeah so look i mean you you wouldn't expect them to buy our software so so what jll did is they actually bought a competitor of ours out of the states um for about three or four years ago for some crazy amount of money um here in australia i look yeah look you probably wouldn't sign them up because you know they have a lot of them have spent you know hundreds of millions, millions of dollars on their tech platforms but it'll be one of those things you know you never know what the future holds, but that could be a potential exit for Urbanize one day. If one of these large guys say, look, instead of paying license fees to Urbanize, that they actually buy the entire organization. But um, yeah, that would be the only way we'd probably engage with them. It's, it's unlikely that they'd actually you know, buy our tech otherwise. Okay. And then let me just check if we get any more final questions here. Um, uh, the, on the business and development staff um i think you said you've moved from three to eight and you're hoping to maybe add a few more uh, mm. resources there and um, how much in AR are they expected to generate once they're they're up and running yeah so look a typical sales rep um and i'll talk about the reps that we have today um the target that they're achieving is about a million bucks per year worth of recurring revenue and about half a million dollars per year worth of professional fees. Now, in terms of those heads, um, it's not just salespeople, it's the entire kind of support infrastructure we're putting around them. So, you know, we've put on an account manager, we've got a telemarketer, we've put on a full-time marketing person. Um, so, you know, it's it's that infrastructure, not just the individual heads. I mean, but all, all in all, I mean, the team that we're building up, you know, we expect them over 12 to 18 months um, to hopefully generate about $6 million per year worth of recurring revenue for us. And then, you know, what will invariably happen is once that happens and that's stable and, and that's working, then we'll probably do, do the next round of investment in that area. Okay, great. Um, and when do you expect to get the, the last of those positions filled? Is that going to be kind of in the second half? Yeah, look, I mean, o over the next six months, look, the, the very, very difficult roles to fill because um, invariably with a salesperson, if they perform well, they don't leave their current employee. If they perform bad, you don't want them. So you've got to get them at the right time. So it's a very difficult, difficult thing to do. But it's, you know, in, in the next six months, we'll hopefully go get the right people in those roles. Okay, great. And then final question. I think, oh no, we've, ooh, we've got a few more after coming in last second. Um, hmm. uh, what the, uh, the Zapier integration tool, um, how important is that to you in terms of integrating with other systems, I guess, that uh, some of these strata managers, I'm guessing, are, or maybe the facilities managers um, might be using? Yeah, look, it's, it's a very astute question. So as a tech company, you always want to think about like what are the, the things 
that we can take to a market that our competitors can't um, because we're cloud and they're not. And Zapier, which it's think about it as like an app store, but for integration platforms. So you know, allows you to connect to Urbanize, to Facebook, to WhatsApp, to you know, to Salesforce, to different CRM systems, to different finance systems. So that's one of the strategic choices we made about 12 months ago to really invest in that side of things. And what it does, it kind of really opens up the ecosystem of other platforms. Because, you know, invariably, we won't be the best at everything. You know, we have an amazing analytics tool, but someone might say, no, no, look, I want to use Tableau. And what that allows you to do is to suck the data out of Urbanize and ingest it into a tool like Tableau. Um, and it's one of those things that really differentiate ourselves. I mean, the competitors in both the spaces, because a lot of the FM companies aren't what I would call true cloud, where you do an upgrade every two weeks with 20 new features. A lot of those guys just simply don't support tech like that. And so what it means is they have to build that functionality in every single use case, while we can kind of pick our 10 use cases and get really deep there and integrate to platforms on Zapier to do the other parts. Okay, great. And then I guess average customer contract lengths on the uh, on both sides of the business? Mm. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a funny one. So I, um, I haven't actually pushed customers to sign up for a long period of time. Because invariably what happens, look, except for, you know, the, the two customers we lost uh, in the last half, um, we tend not to lose customers. I mean, they were the first customers we lost in, in a very long time. So it's like, like I said, like once you're on a finance system like zero, you tend not to get off. So then when customers sign up for two, five, you know, three, five year periods, they often want a discount. And, you know, we have no real incentive to do that. Um, the only discounts we do give is for upfront payment. You know, if they pay 12 months in advance, they get a, a bit of a better rate. Um, similarly, on the facility side, you know, we've got customers that have signed up for 10 year terms. Um, we tend, again, not to do that as much these days because they always want a discount and, and there's no incentive for us to give that. Okay. And then, um, I guess, major kind of news flow people should expect to see over, over the next six months. You know, what are, what are some key milestones you're, you're trying to achieve in this half? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, probably the, the objective we have right now is just to finish off that Pika implementation because we do still have about a million dollars worth of recurring revenue we want to realize over, over, the, over the next little while. And then it's, you know, if you if you stay on our socials, we do lots of press releases for the various wins that we have. And it's really going to be just the new customers that we're busy signing up and kind of converting into revenue. Okay, great. Saurabh, I think we're, we're going to leave it there for now. Thank you so much. Uh, a lot of questions I had to pepper you with there, but uh, thank you very yep, much. No worries at all. And if anybody wants to get in touch with you uh, to find out more, what's the best uh, way to get in touch? Yeah, look, if you, if you send an email off to just to F. Dixon um, at City Door Magnus, and that will uh, come through to me as well. Okay, perfect. That's great. And I do believe our next presenter is lined up. Uh, yeah, Wayne is here. And um, so, sorry, if you can stop sharing your screen and then we can get Wayne to hand over and take, take us through his presentation. Okay, Wayne, if you can just go to slightly, uh, yeah, I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, Wayne, you're, you're good to go. Great, thank you, Mark. Apologies, I was just looking for the uh, unmute button there. So, thanks everybody for your time. Uh, quick, quick break between uh, two presentations. But my name is Wayne. I'm the CEO and founder of SkyFi. Um, formerly living and based in Sydney, but now now living in uh, in San Francisco in the Bay Area. Um, so quick, quick little background on the business, just for everyone's context. I'm sure some of you have heard the story before and others may not, but um, SkyFi is a, um, a business that uh, builds or at, at its core has built a software platform, which um, the primary use case for the platform is it gathers data and data from a, a growing variety of different uh, technology sources. And I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what, what those are and why it's relevant, but um, we're, we've been in business uh, since 2012. We, we operate across uh, about 35 countries now. Um, so, you know, small teams in seven countries across all continents. And um, we operate across uh, 11 different industry verticals. And we're installed in terms of our software across uh, actually closer to 11,000 venues around the world. And when I talk about venues, I mean 
Uh, any public space is basically a target for us. So we work a lot with shopping centers, airports, uh, office buildings, um, outdoor precincts like beaches and smart cities, uh, hospitals, university campuses, um, the list kind of goes on. So anywhere there's, there's, a, there's movement and flow of people is a, is a relevant uh, environment for us to operate in. So uh, what we've built then is a, is a, a business model around uh, our proprietary technology, which, is, which we call the IO platform. It, is, it, is, it comprises of three different software products. And then uh, the fourth kind of arm of our revenue line is our services division, which is predominantly focused around data science and digital marketing services. So um, the, the tech then you know, bro broke it up into these three product families, which we call Connect, Insight and Engage. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about each one of those. So Connect is the, um, the part of the platform that, is, um, that connects into uh, various technologies that are inherent in physical environments today, such as Wi-Fi networks, uh, camera systems, people counting solutions, CCTV systems, um, point of sale terminals. Uh, these are all you know, the types of, of technologies that our platform integrates into. And, and, and gathers data from. And so give you a, a quick use case to kick things off. We, we can track through Wi-Fi, for example, we can track every single device, uh, be that a mobile device or a wearable or a laptop, um, that as long as Wi-Fi is turned on on that device uh, and it enters a space, we can pick up where that device is located in that particular environment. And we can track its movements anonymously in that environment so that helps to understand, you know, venues to understand things like flow, dwell, you know, visit count, occupancy level, all these types of things. Um, cameras, similar to type of use case, we can count traffic, we can understand journey patterns, the movement habits, dwell time, um, frequency, all these types of different things. And then obviously the list gets, gets longer and we get more and more contextual as, as we add more and more data. But um, so Connect kind of goes in on every deployment. Insights is the business intelligence uh, part of the tool. That's where the, the data is visualized, basically. Um, and then Engage is our marketing platform. That, that's the part of the platform that customers use to send out, in some cases, marketing messages, in other cases, alerts and threshold monitoring um, alerts and those kinds of applications. So, and then Labs, as I, as I spoke about, is the services team now. It, it goes very, very much hand in glove with, with any deployment of our software. Um, software goes in and then we, we, we also second in our, our team of data scientists and digital strategists to help these customers um, use the data that our platform gathers and apply it to their um, specific business outcomes. So the, the model does work hand, hand in hand. So you know, what am I talking about when I, when I talk about location technologies. Well, here's an example of, of the types of, of systems and, and technology infrastructure that we, that we integrate with. We are, for the most part, purely a software overlay. So we don't need to stick in any hardware or, or you know, send out someone down to a building to install the, to install the product. It can be done remotely. Uh, we overlay over these kinds of things. So generally, there is a, a Wi-Fi network in the building already. There is generally a um, you know, a camera system or a people counting solution or a beacon network or a point of sale system or a building management platform. So these are all things that are generally already in the buildings. If not, we can obviously bring in partners to, to install them, um, but, if, but generally they are. And so our software can sit over the top of all these different disparate systems, pull all the data into one place, um, aggregate the information across all these different technologies and provide a much better view of what's going on in, in the environment. So, you know, in, in the current climate, there's a lot of, obviously a lot of effort, a lot of work going into helping buildings manage occupancy, right? Every single space in the world these days has, um, you know, uh, the need to know how many people are in the building, you know, how many people are congregating in the lifts? Do we have too many people in the meeting room? You know, all that, you know, are people social distancing? These are all things that are quite in vogue at the moment. Um, but you know, outside of COVID use cases, uh, understanding flow of traffic through security lines in airports is important. Understanding you know, visitor metrics in a retail sense is obviously also important. So these are all things that preceded COVID, but um, that's basically the, 
the, the ecosystem that we occupy. Um, our, our products then, just you know, at a high level, are sold. I'll come back to the operations slide in a second, but our products are sold in two revenue lines, basically. The, the Connect, Insight, and Engage software products are sold on a recurring revenue uh, basis, subscription model. Uh, we charge a fee, depending on what product and, and the venue type, we charge a fee per venue per month, typically on three or five year contract terms. So we have a, a rolling kind of index across our portfolio today and the average contract length is just over three years. So longer term, stickier revenue model. Um, and that makes up about 60, 63% of our revenues today is, is underpinned by recurring revenues. So a really, really key part of our mix. And then non-recurring revenues, which relates to the, the services part of the, uh, of the, of the model, um, for the most part, project-based revenues there, but, but strongly underpin our recurring revenues. And then in, in the case where we are actually um, bringing partners in to install infrastructure, which we do from time to time, that is also a non-recurring revenue line, which is a, a strong key indicator for recurring revenues to follow. I'll just flick back then to operating highlights um, just to give you some flavor for the types of things we've been doing more recently. Um, so this is, a, this is a copy of our, of our current quarterly presentation. So a lot of work, you know, in the last particularly nine, 12 months has gone into developing, um, you know, products or at least features that can help businesses, you know, use this technology to, you know, to, to drive um, metrics around occupancy, right? Uh, every restaurant, every office space, every shopping center, every airport is needed to tighten their belt around um, knowing you know, how many people are in their spaces and being able to, to manage thresholds. So we launched a product called Occupancy Now in, in April or May of last year. Uh, it's been a great part of our mix. It, it really is the same underlying technology we've always had, but just with a different kind of wrapper. Um, but it has driven strong, strong conversion, particularly in the grocery uh, space. Every supermarket chain, again, you know, has the need or has, has needed to put something like this in place. So we've seen a lot of uptake there. University campuses, as students have returned to, to campus, again, have needed to use something like this, which um, the, the, the software uses either cameras or Wi-Fi to track how many people are coming in and leaving a space. Pretty simple, but really, really, really relevant at the moment. Um, we've also started to invest significantly uh, in this period into our artificial intelligence capability, particularly around video analytics. Um, you know, a really key part of our outdoor um, smart city uh, focus has been working with you know various types of camera cameras and and motion sensors to help cities understand usage of you know bike lanes for example um, do they have enough uh, loading bays in downtown precincts for all of the Amazon trucks that we all see on the streets these days so a lot of city planning initiatives that rely on this data um, so our ability to be able to classify images as you can see in that in that particular JPEG there. You, know, you can see bikes as distinct from people, as distinct from trucks, as distinct from buses, as distinct from cars, right? So these are the types of things we're doing uh, using artificial intelligence. Um, we also have had a, a really sort of strong uh, cadence in the last four years of, you know, complementing what has been, you know, double digit recurring revenue growth quarter on quarter for the last five years uh, with some, some acquisition activity. We, we are you know, the only company in our, in our space that is listed. So we, we, are, we are looking to become the, the industry consolidator as well. And so we've, we've made four um, relatively small but meaningful acquisitions over the last four years. The most recent one was a company called Blix, which is an Australian-based company that is, has a, a tracking technology focused particularly on small and mid-market enterprise, whereas our software solutions have been mainly focused on enterprise. Um, we now have an offering that is purpose built for SMB and mid market. So that's opened up a lot of possibility for us in those sectors. In the quarter, um, you know, this is quite operational. I, 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 um, for some of you, I'm sure haven't had much history with the business, but, uh, but nonetheless, you know, interesting to see, um, we, we, we actually signed two large contract renewals in the last uh, six weeks, you know, right in the sort of eye of the storm, I suppose in terms of retail and their response to COVID. Uh, David Jones re-signed with us for another three years across their portfolio and they're, and they're big users of the Occupancy Now solution as well. 
Um, we also re-signed a company called Nuffield Health, which is a large healthcare provider in the UK, again, on another three-year contract. Uh, we signed a five-year contract with Metro Washington Airports in the US, so that's the Washington DC Airport Group. Um, you know, so again, airports have been sort of severely hurt in the last 12 months, no doubt, through the lack of travel, but see the value in putting in a technology such as ours. So five-year deal there. Um, and then some new business through uh, grocery and also public precincts in, uh, in zoos as well. So um, a broad mix, again, uh, in the last quarter in terms of contract wins. So from a, I guess from a, a, a revenue perspective, uh, I'm sure some of you have been waiting for me patiently to get to this slide, but give you some idea of the financial performance of the business, not just in the last quarter, but over the last uh, you know, three or four years. It's been a strong, consistent growth trajectory since you know, FY, end of FY17 really, um, where we've, we've consistently delivered you know, somewhere in the order of 10 to 10 to 15% quarter, quarter on quarter growth at the recurring level, pretty much every quarter since FY18 until now, we've continued to do that. So Q, Q2 of FY21 was no, no different. Uh, we actually showed a 25% quarter on quarter growth rate from Q from Q1 to Q2 this year. Uh, arguably look off, off a lower base, uh, Q4 2020 obviously was um, the period where we saw the need to suspend some customer contracts due to the, you know, the immediate impacts of COVID. We've seen 99%, I believe, of those contracts now return to the PL and obviously we've, we've, we've delivered growth. So 4 million top line revenue number for the quarter is the highest we've ever, we've ever delivered and uh, we're back in our, in our view to pre-COVID kind of growth trajectory in terms of our, our revenues. Um, ARR at the moment is sitting at uh, just over 11 and a half million, um, obviously growing uh, month on month and quarter on quarter. We've got a strong cash position um, up almost 30% quarter on quarter to three and a half million. And that moves around between, you know, two, two and a half to three and a half, basically depending on receivables. But um, nonetheless, uh, the business is operating at at a positive operating EBITDA position has been for, well, since, since uh, FY18 really, and will continue to do that. So no you know, requirements to raise capital to continue to operate. Um, and then, you know, looking at it at a, at a half on half perspective, uh, again, pleasing to see that, uh, you know, second half FY20 to first half 21, some growth in both uh, revenues and, uh, and EBITDA over that period. So, um, you know, really, really pleased with, with how the business has, you know, traded through the last 12 months particularly, but reacted in terms of product development, but also proven itself to be integral and critical really um, at some of the worst times that we've seen in, in modern history. So we're really buoyant about what, you know, what, what the world looks like for this company moving forward. I think we've flown under the radar for, for long enough now, um, but we've, we've got a demonstrated track record in terms of our revenue performance and our EBITDA performance. Um, we're starting to importantly kick some decent revenue goals now in the US where I'm based. Uh, in fact, I think we signed six new US based customers in the last quarter. So that's definitely, you know, um, be, been a key focus for us to start to be successful in the US and we're starting to do that. Um, so I'll close on the revenue side with this slide here, which just gives you a, a, a view and this will, be a, this will be something we'll continue to uh, implement into our quarterlies. A, a rolling 12 month view on, uh, on revenue outlook um, based on what we see as being qualified and at and, 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 and an advanced stage. So this is not our total pipeline. This is just the kind of pointy end of the funnel where we see these deals, you know, meaningfully progressing. Um, and so, you know, at the moment we're, we're looking at a qualified pipeline for the next 12 months of over 20, 23 million. Uh, with about 2.6 million sitting in contract negotiation at the moment, so fairly certain revenue, um, and then you know just under five million bucks sitting in in what we call pilot stage. So you know I would say that contract negotiation, you know we're looking at a 90 95 percent you know confidence level around converting um, pilot projects, probably 60 to 70 percent um, uh, confidence level in, in converting, and then it kind of obviously dilutes a bit from there. Um, once they're in pilot, you know, we, we've generally got them locked up uh, to some deliverables that we know we can achieve. And then uh, we, it, it's just about getting them into a contracting phase after that. 
So in closing, a uh, key sort of outlook statement for the continuation of the rest of the year. Um, we're seeing a lot of, you know, a lot of good, good work being done in terms of our, um, our investment into marketing. Um, lot, strong amount of lead generation coming into the business at the moment through our digital marketing efforts. So we're, we're actually doubling down on that, on that particular part of our, our, our investment strategy. Um, really for the first time, I think, you know, it's fair to say 12 months ago, we, we, this business was growing through a lot of its own outbound sales efforts. Um, we've now got a marketing function that's, that's driving a lot of lead gen inbound and we, we like the look of that. So um, focused on that, we are, you know, we're seeing a lot of traction in terms of conversion uh, still in the grocery vertical. So we're continuing to, to forage in that particular part of the business. Um, we are um, confident in some growth in, in, in other verticals like corporate offices as they start to reopen. Uh, university campuses, again, as they've started to reopen recently. Um, and then smart cities and municipalities, seeing a lot of use cases there, uh, as I mentioned earlier, around, um, you know, uh, precinct usage and, and uh, driving people back into, you know, public spaces and downtown precincts. We, you know, as always, uh, our, our product development team is nimble. We will continue to develop new products uh, all the time. I think we release a new product feature list every two weeks already. So that will continue. Um, we will maintain a, a strong focus as we always do on cash management. We're not, uh, you know, we, we, we're looking to continue to work uh, and survive on our own cash, um, uh, cash at bank position uh, and maintain a positive EBITDA. That's always been a key goal for us. We, um, we you know, we, we will, you know, continue to, to work on the integration of things like the Blix product. And, and you know, I'm pleased to really, ready to see some strong pipeline traction from Blix in the US and the UK market. So not just in, in the Australian region. So a strong uh, integration uh, of that product already. And then, you know, very key part of our growth strategy is to continue to look at, you know, strategic acquisitions that we can, we can tuck into our operations and, uh, and, and look to continue to grow both organically and through uh, acquisition. So with that, thank you for your time and, and very happy to take any questions. Thanks, Wayne. Um, if I can just, uh, we had one question uh, emailed in ahead of time and then I'll um, maybe jump to one or two of the questions. If there is any from the from the audience, it, it, it goes back to the, the acquisitions you were just talking about um, going forward. Are you more looking for acquisitions on the on the product side going forward? Or are you more looking um, on an acquisition that's going to get you into, you know, a new geography or a new industry vertical? You know, wh where where is the acquisition focus going forward? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, look, uh, uh, the, the short answer is, is unfortunately, it's all of the above. Um, to be more specific, it, it really depends on, the, the, there are smaller companies out there where we're not going to be as, as interested in the technology, but we'll be interested in, you know, the, the customer base and the geographic spread that that company might offer us. And so the, the, those deals are still out there um, and we will, we will still continue to pursue them to continue to grow our geographic footprint, you know, um, we've got some, some, still got some gaps out there in, in places like, you know, Asia, Scandinavia, the Middle East, where, you know, we, we'd like to continue to grow our, our reach. And so that still makes sense. But the, the main primary goal at the moment is um, reach offshore. So reach internationally is really important, uh, as in geographic reach. Um, but also, um, we're more considerate now of, of, of additional technology that we can integrate into our solution. So Blix was kind of a hybrid example of that, where it was a small deal, which gave us footprint in, in a customer vertical we don't operate in today. So that, that added, you know, meaningful ARR to our business. Um, but it was, it's a product offering that we don't have and, and we will build into our tech stack certainly over time, but um, a part of the market segment we can, we can attack, you know, straight away. And that was worth buying for that reason. And I think, We'll continue to look through that lens um, in terms of the international markets where there is interesting technology that we know is missing and it makes more sense to buy it rather than to spend a year building it we, you know we'll, we will look at that okay a question from the audience when and does managing the board see continued strong top line growth as a strategic priority or is there a point envisaged that which the revenue cost jaws will be will be allowed to open um, yes, uh, look, ab absolutely. I think, um, 
you know, top line growth is still, and well, top line and recurring revenue growth is still the main goal. We're going to be invest, you know, continuing to, you know, I think we will grow our EBITDA position this year, um, but it's not a key focus to drive absolute bottom line um, just yet. We, we there's still too much growth opportunity for us, you know, for us out there that we want to keep investing back into the business to to achieve. So short answer is, you know, in the in the next 12 months, we're, we're not envisaging you know, too much of a change in that in that opening of the jaws um, yet. Um, it's still very much about growing that ARR. Okay. And then another question, um, uh, industry verticals, is there one that you're, you're missing currently? Or I, I, across those, I think you said 11 at the start of the presentation. Are you kind of in everywhere you want to be and it's more about growing into those verticals or is there one kind of, big one that, that's kind of missing out of, out of that portfolio of, of uh, verticals? Yeah, uh, look, I would say we, we are in all of the ones that that, that make sense um, for us today. And, and yes, so the, the, the goal really is, to, is more, you know, we, we, we've got a fairly thin spread across some of them. Um, in fact, all of them really, if you think about the global opportunity. So definitely need to go deeper, um, you know, more customers, but also to go deeper in terms of the technology application in those customers. And hence why, you know, we, we, we talk about this ability to integrate with more and more data sources. You know, there's a, a big opportunity, for example, for us to, to move into in the IoT space where, um, you know, integrating smart lighting and, and uh, HVAC systems and these kinds of applications are, are a natural fit for us, which will add more revenue lines and more, you know, um, you know, re revenue growth opportunity for in existing customers and, and obviously open up more relevance to more customers as well. So definitely, I think the 11 or 12 that we're in today is is kind of, you know, the, the gambit and we, we need to go deeper. Okay, great. I'll just show it back now. If we got any final questions for Wayne, I'll just give it a minute here, Wayne, in case we get one or two more. No, we don't have any more, it seems. Okay, Wayne, um, I'd like to thank you very much for dialing in all the way from uh, San Francisco. And, and I know you've uh, got a busy morning or busy morning slash afternoon. So thanks for taking the time to present to us today. And as I said, yeah, the recording of Wayne's presentation and our, and our first presentation will be up on the YouTube channel probably late Friday or sometime over the weekend. And uh, I'd like to make a special thanks to Wayne. This is his uh, second time presenting at Coffee Microcaps. The first time was when we had an actual in-person conference. Those were the days. Um, and it's uh, it's great to have them back on again to give us an update. Right. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>